Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today we're starting a brand new mini series entitled Unforgiveness. When we walk in unforgiveness, it's like trying to walk a straight line looking behind us. I want you to know that it's impossible to walk a straight line that's in front of you if you're continually, constantly looking behind you. You will stumble over little things. You will trip up over big things. And worst of all, you will get completely off course. When I was in the military, my MOS was field artillery, self-propelled. We gave fire support to infantry units and armored divisions. But anyway, the M109A2 howitzer that I was assigned to could hit a target 9 or 10 miles with accurate precision. That is, if the coordinates entered were exactly right. Think about this for a moment. If for some reason the gunner was slack and did not enter the coordinates accurately, was off just one degree, we were to shoot that 98 pound, 155 millimeter round, one mile, just one mile down range, we would be off 92 point two feet. Now, to make it easier, let's multiply that by 10 miles. So just multiply it by 10. That would equate to 922 feet or 0.18 miles. That distance could mean the lives of many innocent people. Now, let's think about traveling. If we're off one degree when we're traveling, Take, for instance, maybe traveling from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., we would completely miss our target by 42.6 miles. For a more graphic picture, that would mean that we would wind up in Baltimore. Not exactly where we were planning on going, not exactly where we were headed. Now, if we're traveling super far distances, we could end up hundreds of thousands of miles off course even millions of miles off course, if the distance is far enough. Now, let us apply this to the spiritual. Let's, let's make a spiritual application of this. If we're so busy looking backward that we get off course just one degree, which doesn't seem very relevant, it doesn't seem like it's really important in the beginning, but by the time we come to stand before the judge of all creation, we could be completely off course. Remember, Jesus said that narrow is the gate and straight is the path that leads to eternal life. Therefore, if the gate is that small and the path is that straight, we need a more accurate aim. Our aim must be, it must be very very precise. See, one of those things that set us off a degree or two is unforgiveness. Sometimes we feel we're hurt too badly to forgive. So we go through life leaning on that hurt and getting more and more off course as we nurse that hurt, nurse that hurt feeling. And we think about it, we, we, we dwell on it, and we mold it over in our mind and we get more and more hurt until we completely lose our way. Let us not let that happen to us, but let us struggle to fight the good fight of faith and arrive at the appointed target, that is, eternity with Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And one way to do this is by burying the past. And once we bury the past, we leave it buried in the past. We don't go back and dig it up and rehash all of the hurts. This message today is entitled, The Merciless Servant. So turn with me please to our scripture found in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 through 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. 
Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle account with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. See, Jesus had just got through teaching on forgiveness and how to be reconciled to your brother. He said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. If he doesn't listen to you, take one or two more with you and try to settle it that way. But if he still doesn't listen, tell it to the church. And if he still doesn't listen, then treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. Then Peter, the great Peter, he gets this brilliant idea. Well, if he doesn't listen to the church, then I can take matters in my own hands, can I? So he asked Jesus, what is my limit to forgive? Is it seven times? Yeah. It has to be seven times, Peter's thinking. On the eighth time, I will draw out my sword and chop off an ear. I bet he'll listen then. I ain't playing. But Jesus doesn't agree with that logic. He says, no, no, Peter. Not seven times, but 77 times, 77 times. In other words, Jesus is explaining that forgiveness is like love. It's a debt that can never be repaid. If you're required to love even your enemies, then we have to forgive them first of all. We cannot love them if we do not forgive them. So forgiveness is a prerequisite to love. Have you ever wondered why it is so hard to love some people? It's because you haven't forgiven them. Maybe you're still holding them up over something they said. Something that they don't even remember, but you still remember. You might not even realize that you're holding them up for something, whatever that thing is. Maybe they, the way that they talked to you in the past without even knowing. And you're still holding them up for that. You're still holding that offense that they offended you with. You're still holding that against them. Then Jesus goes into the parable of the unforgiven servant in order to explain how the kingdom of heaven works. He said, it can be compared to a king who wanted to collect the debt that was owed to him. So he called all his servants who had outstanding debt, saying, the time has come. Your debt has matured. It's now time for you to pay. So the servant did not have the money nor did he have the means to get the money. He had racked up 10,000 talents of debt. Now, one talent is about 75 pounds, the scholars tell us. Consider that one ounce of gold is traded at over $1,900. And there, is, there are 16 ounces in a pound. From this calculation, the servant owed somewhere in the vicinity of $22.8 billion. 
dollars. He owed more than he could ever repay in a hundred lifetimes. It was no way in the world for him to get that kind of money. So the king ordered that he, his wife, and his children, and everything that he had to be sold and the debt repaid. But the servant fell on his knees and began to cry with big alligator tears, begging for mercy. Please, please be patient with me and I will repay you everything I owe you. I promise, I promise, cross my heart and hope to die. He cried, wiping tears from his eyes with the back of his hand. He didn't care who, who was watching. He didn't even care if they were snickering. He was begging for his own freedom, the freedom of his family, the freedom of his wife, the freedom of his children. He did not care. All he was thinking of, I can never repay this. Let me put this off as long as I can, and I'm going to try to find some way to repay it. But please don't let it happen right now. So seeing the sight of this grown man kneeling in front of him, crying and weeping and begging, the king felt pity for his servant and had mercy on him. His heart was moved with compassion that he didn't just forgive or, or give him time to repay. He gave, he forgave the debt completely. The entire debt was wiped off of the books. You are forgiven. In other words, I'm going to write paid in full. Although you haven't paid one dime, I'm going to forgive you the whole debt. $22.8 billion worth of debt. When that servant heard the new judgment, he was ecstatic. He was so filled with joy. He was overjoyed. And he went out. He wanted to jump up. He wanted to wrap his arms around this king and hug him and give him a kiss because he was so happy. He left the presence of the king whistling and smiling and a joy in his heart and a new bop in his step. He was triumphantly walking down the sidewalk, a load of debt off of his shoulders. It was like he was given a new lease on life. The news of that great debt forgiveness has spread like wildfire. All the other servants were talking and pointing and whispering as he walked by, his head held high. Look, there goes the man who the king forgave $23 billion and his story grew. Some people will probably even say, you know what, $50 billion that he forgave. Then the servant caught sight of one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, one denarii is equal to a Roman silver coin, equivalent to a laborer's daily wage. Apparently, a laborer's daily wage in our day ranges anywhere from $17 to $45 per hour. So I want us to use that highest one. Let us use the $45, and we're going to set it at 10 hours a day. So 45 times 10 would equal to $450 per day. Now let us multiply that by 100. It was a 100 of those denarii, $450. That would equal to $45,000, which, I mean, is a lot of money, mind you. It's not nothing just a snigger, right? That's a lot of money still. But nothing, absolutely nothing, it's not even a drop. It's not even the interest on this 22.8 billion dollars that he had owed, that he had just got forgiven for. So this $45,000 is absolutely nothing. And what does he do? He runs up to him, he grabs him by the neck, and he begins to choke him while yelling in his face and spit going all over the place, all in the man's face. Pay me what you owe me and pay me now. And the man and the meekest, smallest voice that he could muster. Please, sir, give me just a little bit of time and I will repay you everything I owe you. Please have mercy on me, please. But instead of extending the same mercy, 
he had just received, he hauled him off to debtor's prison and threw him in prison until he could pay the whole thing. Then dusting his hands off, he strode out into the warm sunlight, began whistling to himself again. But his actions did not go unnoticed by his fellow servants. It blew up social media. The video of what he did went viral. Everyone was horrified at the heartlessness of that servant, even those who did not even know who those two servants were. So someone went and told the king what had happened. The king couldn't believe his ears, so they had to show him the whole video. And the king saw everything and heard everything that took place. When the king saw the cruelty and the mercilessness of that servant, he ordered them, bring him to me and bring him now. They all rushed out and caught hold of that wicked servant and dragged him back to the king and flung him at the king's feet. The king said, you wicked servant, I forgave you, not because I had to, but because you pleaded and you begged me to. I felt pity for you and forgave you such a great debt. Why? Why would you not have the same mercy on your fellow servant who owed you so little in comparison? You wicked, disgusting servant. Now you pay me what you owe me. I rescind my former decision to forgive your debt. And the king delivered him over to the jailers until he should pay all of the debt that he owed. Now this word jailers is actually the word torturers. It is the only time, the one and only time, that it is used in the New Testament. Jesus said that the merciless servant was delivered over to the torturers to be tortured until he was able to repay the full debt. But think about this for a moment. If the merciless servant was not able to pay back the debt while he was a free man to roam around and make investments and conduct business, how in the world would he be able to get finances to pay off such a huge debt locked up in prison behind debtor's bars? It will be impossible for that to happen. And if it is impossible to get the finances to pay the debt that you owe while in prison, then that would suggest that that person would spend eternity in debtor's prison being tortured daily, every day, for the rest of eternity. We believe that in eternity, there will be torturers that torture the unredeemed for all eternity. Because Jesus suggested it. For they will be cast out into utter darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, the scripture tells us. I believe this is exactly what Jesus is suggesting that will happen to those who will not, not they couldn't, but they will not forgive others who have sinned against them. Those who keep harping on this unforgiveness. Those who harden their hearts against those who have sinned against them. They will be cast out into utter darkness, away from his presence. I want you to think about this. It is not so much the amount of debt that was owed that he was imprisoned for. Because yet the king had already forgiven him of all his debt. So that he could go free. He didn't have to repay it. So it was not that at all. It was not the amount he owed, but his unforgiven hard heart, his mercilessness. He held a grudge. He wanted someone else to pay for their mistakes while he himself go free. But Jesus said, it doesn't work that way in the kingdom of heaven. If you want forgiveness, you must also forgive. The merciless servant who refuse to forgive will be handed over to the torturers for all eternity because it is impossible to repay the debt that you owe God. I remember one time my family and I were ministering to a woman who had a lot of hurt. 
that came with a lot of unforgiveness. When we explained to her that she has to forgive in order to be forgiven, she was like, you don't understand what happened to me. When she explained to us that, that she had all this unforgiveness in her heart and the reasons why she had these unforgiveness in her heart, she said, you don't know what has happened to me. She recounted times of sexual abuse from an early age by family members. And I'm not downplaying that. That's hurtful. That will scar a child. She explained times of being shot and left for dead by friends. Being used and abused by others. Without mistake, hers was and is a heartbreaking story. Something I myself could not identify with because thank the Lord, it never happened to me. I did not experience that growing up. But be that as it may, Jesus said in order to receive forgiveness, we must give forgiveness. We reap what we sow. So if you want forgiveness, you want to reap forgiveness, you must sow forgiveness. When we tried explaining to her, she said she was happy to go to hell and burn forever if only she could get the opportunity to repay those people that had owed her, who had done these things to her. She wanted repayment. She wanted retribution. She wanted vengeance. Vengeance is what was on her mind, nothing else. She wanted them to suffer the same pain, if not more, the same pain that she herself had suffered. Her heart was hard towards those people who caused her such pain and agony. And from a human point of view, we would say, yes, she has all rights to do that. And we can identify with her. We could even cheer her on. Yes, you are right. You are absolutely right. But the thing is, when we become a child of God, we give up all of our rights. We give up all of ourself. We're no longer our own. We are now bought at a price. Jesus owns us. We no longer own ourselves. So we give up all rights to ourselves. All of past hurts, all the debts owed us are not our debts anymore. They're not against us, they're against Jesus, because we're not ourselves. So all of those debts against us are now wiped clean, just like the debts we, we stacked up against God has been wiped clean. We're no longer slaves to hate and embitterment. We are now redeemed, forgiven, so that we might also forgive those who have sinned against us. No matter how grievous the trespass is, we are more grievous against God, and God has forgiven us. So let me ask you, are you holding on to past hurts? Are you a merciless servant who's chasing down a fellow servant who owes you $45,000 when you owe $23 billion? I realize it's a difficult thing. It's not easy just to say, I forgive you. I forgive you that $45,000. But someone said, oh, but Brother Kenny, you have never been hurt like that. And I would say, true. I've never been hurt like that woman has been hurt. But I have been betrayed by someone I had respected, someone I trusted immensely. I felt hurt. I felt the need to exact my pound of flesh. But you know what? I didn't. Because it would cause more bad than good. I considered the end result and chose to forgive. I'm not saying that all things are that easy. But it is crucial to your own forgiveness. If you want to be forgiven, you must forgive others. I want to pray for you, all those who are hurting, all those who have pain of the past. 
You've been molested as a child. You've been talked about. You've been done wrong. I want to pray for you. Let me pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, just bring all of those who are hurting, those who have been wronged, the sexual abused, the physically abused, the mentally and psychologically abused, those who have suffered untold sins, those who are, have, have been done wrong so hard, so often, that their hearts are hard and forgiveness is hard to find. I pray, oh Lord God, that you would soften their hearts. Help them to see, Lord, that even though someone owes them 45,000, 100 denarii, they owe you 10,000 talents. And they want forgiveness, Lord. Help them to forgive. Help us to forgive so that we might be forgiven. I pray, Lord, for their wounds, that you would heal their wounds. I pray, Lord God, that that balm of Gilead would be applied to the hurt, to the open, festering wounds, and that they would be healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and that forgiveness would flow out of their hearts, that that load of unforgiveness would be released off of their shoulders. Let your spirit overshadow each one right now. And let love and forgiveness reign in their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I'm wondering, is there anybody out there who have not, you, you, you have never experienced the forgiveness of the Father? Your debt, your 10,000 talent debt against the Father is still stacked up. It still weighs heavy on you. It's still on the books as unpaid. You've never had your sins forgiven by Jesus, by the Father. But you would like to because you want to spend eternity with Him. You just don't know how. Here's how you do it. You ask, just like that servant asked. You must ask. And you know what? Just like that servant, the master of that servant forgave him, your heavenly father will forgive you as well. Why? Because he loves you. He loved you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, the son of God. He sent him the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, was crucified on the cross, was dead and buried for three days. And on the third day, he rose again. He sent him, that Jesus, to die that you might have life, that you might be forgiven and live forever. If you would like to know that freedom and live forever, here's how. Repeat this prayer after me. Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to help me now to forgive others what they have sinned against me. I ask you to help me to walk that straight and narrow path that when it comes time for me to stand before you, I'll hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I thank you for salvation. I thank you for Jesus. And I thank you for forgiveness. I thank you for life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is get a Bible. It is so, so important. Whether you have one on a bookshelf that's gathering dust or whether you have to go out and buy one, do so. Whichever one you need to do, do it and do it quickly. There's coming a time when the Bible will be taken away from us. We will not be allowed just like how it is in, in North Korea or, or in China those other places where Jesus is not allowed. It's coming to the free world, this Western world, even right here in America. So buy a Bible, read your Bible every day, learn to
Commit the word of God to memory. Hide it away in your heart. Take a highlighter. Highlight those promises. Highlight the word and memorize what you highlight and live it. Then I want you to find a Bible-believing church that believes in the Word of God, that believes there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live, who believes that one day Jesus is coming back and we will stand before Him and be judged, and we will have to answer for every wrong thing that we've done. There's no, everybody's going to be saved. That is not true. It's a lie. Only a few finds that narrow path. Be one of the few that finds it and live forever with Jesus because of what he did, because of the salvation that he offers. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing exactly what it is you're supposed to be doing. He say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you. God loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. Be blessed and stay blessed.